Hey guys, and welcome back to the channel. Today we will be doing yet another video about caching. I'm thinking for the next few weekends, I'm probably gonna be doing some non-systems design related content. Uh, got a little collaboration coming up this weekend, but of course for the weekdays we're on our grind. So sit back, crack open a Red Bull, and let's get into this thing. All right, so let's go ahead and get into it. So to get started, since it's been a week since our last video, let's go ahead and do a very quick distributed caching recap. Basically, there are a couple of big pros here. Uh, the main one being reading, of course. Our cache might be physically closer to us. It might be using faster storage. And potentially, we might even get big benefits on writes. Though, to that point, that's still a little bit unclear, and we'll discuss that mainly during this video. Another thing is that effectively, if we have a nice caching layer, it can act as a little bit of a wall between our actual database and our users, and thus reduce some of the load. Another uh, kind of less ideal thing about caching, but still nonetheless there, is that cache misses are expensive, and we always want to be considering this. Whenever we have to reach out to the cache, that's going to take an extra network call, and in addition to that, we actually have to go ahead and search the cache. Now, if this is a hash map based cache, then that's really good for us because, you know, O of 1 time complexity is relatively fast. But sometimes caches can be implemented with something like a tree map that isn't necessarily constant time complexity, and it could add some extra time to your data accesses. So again, there's extra disk and network I.O. there. Or instead of disk, sometimes maybe memory, if that's how we're choosing to implement our cache. Then the last thing is going to be that data consistency and correctness can be tough. Because we have more places to potentially read and write our data from and to, that is going to complicate things. And that's what we'll mainly be talking about today. So we're going to be talking about three different ways of actually going ahead and writing to our databases and getting that correct data in our cache. So let's start with the first one, which is going to be the most simple and most similar to what you would do if you didn't have a cache, which is you would just go ahead and write to the database like normal. So the reason this is called a write around cache is because we're literally writing around it, as you can see right here. Let's imagine that we've got Kate Upton, lovely lady, and she thinks that I'm a 10 out of 10, but previously it was agreed upon that I'm a nine. The first thing that she would do is write to the database. And that's very typical. We've seen that pretty much all throughout anything in systems so far. However, now we're gonna do a couple of extra things. And actually, effectively, we've got two options here. So one I'm gonna be calling invalidation, the other I'll call a stale read. So the stale read would be Kate Upton has written to the database, but then you know we don't really do anything. And you know when she next reads from the cache, she'll see that uh, Jordan is nine, which is obviously not going to be the case because she just wrote 10. So notice that we have this guy right here, a TTL. And effectively, the TTL in a cache says, like, beyond a point, we're going to expire this data. So as you can see, it's Tuesday here. So when Wednesday comes around, what would happen is this whole thing gets removed. Kate Upton's going to make another read request from the cache. The cache is going to say, I don't have it. And then it's going to ask the database, which is going to say, Jordan is a 10. So that's one option, and it's pretty simple. It's just, you know, we get a stale read until our data expires. Another option is we can take a more active approach to this. So let's go ahead and get rid of this stuff, blah, 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 blah. Oh no, I have to draw another box. And effectively now, what Kate Upton would do is the second that she performs this right over here, she's also going to invalidate the Jordan key. And what this does is now the cache is gonna either say, okay, well, uh, it's empty now, so the next time she reads, the cache is going to say, I don't have Jordan, ask the database for it. The database comes back with the value. The cache populates itself with the new value for Jordan and then returns it to Kate Upton with Jordan is 10. So you can see that in the case of the stale read, it's a matter of incorrect data. In the case of invalidation, we'll get the updated write. And so, of course, you have to make the trade-off of when do you actually need correct data? Is it okay to make a write and then not instantly see it? That, of course, is use case dependent. But the thing to note here is that in both of these implementations, we have an expensive cache miss. We now have to basically route our networking call through our cache as a result of the fact that we made a new write and now the cache doesn't have the data. At the same time, writes are very simple. We would do a write just like normal, write to the database, and the database remains our source of truth, which is good because it means that adding a bunch of read-only caches doesn't affect the way that we're already doing our existing writes, which technically makes them a little bit easier in theory. 
Okay, now let's talk about the write through cache. This is when we really start getting cheeky. So again, there are a couple of approaches that we can take here to do this. Why is it called a write through cache? Well, of course, when Corinna Kopf here decides that I am yet again a 10 out of 10 and updates the cache, which previously had me as a nine, this value gets updated to a 10. And then at the same exact time, the cache is also going to write to the database. It's going to proxy that request, say that I'm a 10 out of 10 and the database is going to update its value. Now, obviously something should be standing out to you here, which is that it is always possible that either this write gets made and then this network request doesn't go through or you know just any other thing could happen this write gets made and this cache like goes down or something and then it, you know it gets loaded back up on a stale replica but the point is that unless you have two phase commit it is possible here to have data inconsistencies because at the end of the day it's possible for your cache and your database to get out of sync now if you do use two phase commit then that is slow because that's just how two-phase commit is. It would take quite a few more network calls. I'd first have to make a network call here. I'd have to make one here. They'd both have to respond okay to say they're ready to commit. And then now I'd have to make even more network calls back to them to say commit. And that's expensive, right? Now that being said, with the write through cache, you of course can always take the YOLO approach because sometimes you just don't need to have super consistent data. It's nice when you do mostly have that because most of the time will be fine, but you do open yourself up to the occasional fault where you would be in trouble. So what are the overall pros and cons of these approaches? Well, basically, of course, we do have nice data consistency simply because of the fact that whenever you write to the cache, that write is also going to the database and vice versa. But at the same time, A, it's relatively slow because you have to write data to a couple of places, and B, especially in the two-phase commit case, it's super slow. So again, kind of use case dependent when you want to be using this, there's definitely no objective solution here. So the last approach that we're going to be talking about is the write back cache. Why is it called write back? Because first, when Megan Fox over here, yet another baddie, decides that I'm a 10 out of 10, the first thing that's going to happen is we write to the cache. And then at some point down the line, or better yet, let's say asynchronously, we'll eventually write that back to the database. And then the database can go ahead and update that value. But there's no guarantees on when that gets written. One thing that a certain lot of write back cache setups like to do is lower the amount of load on the database by mini batching the writes that they've taken on that haven't yet gone to the database. So for example, let's say Megan also decided that besides me being a 10, Machine Gun Kelly, her current boyfriend is a two because I'm more attractive and Donald Trump is a one, that's obvious. So it's possible that we would effectively mini batch these writes and send them all to the database at once. It's a lot more efficient than having to send many different things over the network, just makes life easy. Now, of course, this comes with a couple of issues. If this cache has a certain value for a certain amount of time, and this guy tries to read from the database, it's very possible that they won't see the up-to-date result because the write-back cache hasn't written it back yet. So what could we do if we really needed to have consistent data here? Well, we could have something like a distributed locking service. So whenever we wrote to the cache, you know, what we would also have to do is grab the distributed lock and say Jordan is grabbed. And effectively, as long as the write back cache has the value Jordan and hasn't yet written it back to the database, it's going to stay this way. Of course, that being said, if this guy wants to go ahead and read from Jordan, he would have to try and grab the distributed lock. The distributed lock would then notify the write back cache that someone is trying to read the value. Jordan could then, or rather the write back cache could then write the value to the database and say Jordan is 10. This is all because we tried to grab that distributed lock. And then finally, we would get the up-to-date read value. Now, of course, that does ensure that this guy is gonna see an up-to-date value, but it's possible that Megan Fox could write the value and no one else would ever see it. How? Well, if the cache just fails before it manages to write back to the database. Of course, in combination, using something like distributed locking and cache replication does solve our problem here. But not only does it add a ton of complexity to our system, it also adds a ton of latency, and in many ways kind of just defeats the point of using a write-back cache. The whole reason we want a write-back cache is so that our writes are super fast. We're writing to a low latency place. And so as a result of that, I don't know, personally, even though technically you could make the case that, I don't know, something like GitHub is technically write-back caching with a distributed lock, 
because effectively there's one centralized server. You know, to make a commit, you have to effectively grab the lock, and by writing files locally, you're effectively caching them. You know, generally speaking, when I think of write back caching, I just think of writing to the cache, and hopefully things work out okay. So generally speaking, I'm going to be talking about the YOLO approach when I use this method, which is effectively just write to the write back cache and hope things go all right. So the pros, like I mentioned, quick writes. The cons, well, if that cache goes down, you're in trouble. And uh, if this guy over here decides to read the value before the cache is written back, you're also in trouble. Of course, if your application doesn't care about data staleness issues, then that's great. That would be a good example of a time that you would want to use a write back cache. So what are our conclusions? Well, like I mentioned earlier, all of these types of writing have very different use cases. And you're basically going to optimize different things by choosing one approach or another. So there really is no clear winner here. Each of them have very distinctive pros and cons. But by knowing the pros and cons, you can make the right decision for your application. So like I mentioned, for write around, you're effectively just writing to the database like you normally would. And as a result of that, probably a little bit less complex, but at the same time, you're getting less benefit on reads due to having to get an initial cache miss. At the same time, you've got write through cache, which is effectively where you're just either using a two-phase commit to make sure that everything is super consistent, or you're not and hoping things go okay. In theory, this is a little bit better because your cache and your database are nice and synced up, and the data is already in your cache. And then finally, we've got the write back cache, which is the real YOLO thing here. Write as quickly as possible, and then eventually go ahead and put that data in the database. But if things go down in the meantime, you're probably in trouble. Again, if your application can tolerate that and you just care about giving users quick writes, then that's a really useful thing. Anyways, guys, I hope these trade-offs make sense. Uh, hopefully, decently sensible video, and I hope that you can take this knowledge with you into your systems design interview. Have a great day, and I will see you in the next one.